All right, Kim, welcome to our fun Disco Elysium, our paradise made all our own. Except it's not called a Disco Elysium because that would have been too obvious. Please play Susan and do with me. Oh. Right. <gasps> Crit success! <laughs> I was like, what am I going to do with my time if it doesn't work? I'm going to be in deep shit. I might have to read some books. <laughs> What is detective work, if not an elaborate game? You need logical inference, attention to detail, the ability to analyze your opponent's moves. Come on, it might help us think of more creative solutions to the case. Hmm. I do feel like my thinking has become somewhat rigid. Maybe a little diversion to keep the mind limber is just what's in order. See? He's doing the hard work himself. All I needed was a little nudge. All right, you've convinced me. How do we play? I read the rules already, I'll show you. You explain the basic set of procedures to the lieutenant, who seems to be a quick study. You each take your bags of tokens and counters and unfold the board between you. In the center is the crown of Revachol. Radiating outward are her colorful vassals, each one supplying some raw material. Desired by the suzerain. Apricots from Safra, archaeological, treasures from Ile Marat, sugar from the Seminine Islands, and magenta cocaine from Supermundi and Sara Marisa. There's also a neat little log to keep track of your progress in case you need to put the game away and return to it later. The lieutenant goes first. He draws a contract card and moves several of his workers to the Safra territory of the board and the others to the Seminine Islands. All right, detective, your turn. You have a few options available to you. Will you try to fulfill contracts right away or rearrange your workers to maximize production on future turns? Remember what the rulebook said. You'll want to choose a strategy early and stay committed to it. Just do whatever Kim did. That's a bad idea if you want to succeed usually using the same strategy as somebody else. Try to fulfill a contract. You draw a contract card offering a number of coins in exchange for archaeological treasures. It's always kind of a back and forth, because on one hand you can do preparation stuff for future turns, but at the same time in many games the act of fulfilling a contract or, you know, accomplishing whatever kind of goal system might exist gives you rewards that make it easier to kind of snowball, but so can doing preparatory uh, motions. So, I don't know. Engine building games I'm always back and forth on because it's always like... I've never been great at them, I don't think. <laughs> like, uh, that gem game. What is that? Uh, a gem game where you, you create gems to, to turn in gems, to create more gems, and to comboing. And it's, it's relatively common. I've played it with a number of different people, and I don't own a copy of it, so it's like... People keep bringing it. Different people keep bringing it. So somebody knows what I'm talking about. You draw a contract card offering a large number, a, num a number of coins in exchange for archaeological treasures. You place all of your workers on the Ilium Rat territory. On your next turn, you produce six units of archaeological treasure and fulfill the contract for a handful of coins. Not the bad detective, but not good enough. The lieutenant seems to be saying. As he contemplates his own contract card, the lieutenant is rewarded with four coins and a round and a round wooden token that he places in the center of the board. That's a market. It's worth two victory points. And hey, why don't I get one of those? Don't worry, it was mostly just luck. You'll earn some points soon enough. I'm not even sure what points are, that's part of the problem. Why? I thought I read the directions. Points are nothing. They don't exist. They're just an arbitrary convention that games use to reward or punish players for certain behaviors. Worth noting, isn't it? I was talking before about the incentive structures in games, and be colonial or, or not, that oftentimes the reward structure is like an artificial system, but that system is still what encourages you to do that thing and so it's always worth questioning what certain games 
encourage you to do via their reward structures and their victory conditions what they what they consider to be victory or not because the concept of victory doesn't always necessarily apply in real life situations but in video games or board games it totally does you just win at them so you should always question what the developer or designer determined to be to be worthy of victory Who came up with such a, a concept? Game design, as I imagine. Am I getting points right now? Lieutenant shrugs. There are some paranoid types who believe the moral intern keeps detailed score sheets for everyone in the real belt, but that's obviously nonsense. Otherwise, no. There are no points. Just your acts, actions and the consequences of those actions. Oh, when he said he was looking around, he meant in real life, right? I was going to say, did you read the rules or not? <laughs> he means real life, yeah. That's reassuring. That's just the way it is. The lieutenant does not seem to find much value in dwelling on the subject. Now, I believe it's your turn. Glancing over the board, you see several possible strategies. Pressing more workers into service would increase your economic output and help you survive a possible conflict with the lieutenant. Or you could ignore your labor supply and focus on fulfilling contracts for points and resources. Those aren't your only options. You could also show your workers how much you appreciate them by investing some of that wealth in them. After all, they're the ones producing wealth for the suzerain. Well, sure, you can do that. It's just not a terribly effective strategy, but then it's up to you. <laughs> Just make uh, straight up bad choices. So invest in your existing workers, press more workers into service, focus on filling contracts. Invest in your existing workers. To the lieutenant's puzzlement, you spend several turns building various improvements to your territorial infrastructure. Some of your workers have access to clean water, paved roads, and basic hobbies. In return, they produce one extra resource per turn. That sounds like it's not making the money back. Which is really funny. This is exactly what I was talking about. Having a system that actively discourages you from doing what should be the night, the good thing to do. <laughs> Improving the infrastructure for the people that you rule over so that they have access to clean water is a, as a system that's disincentivized by this mechanic set. You should always question the implications of these things and also wonder whether or not the game is uh, unscrupulously and uncritically regurgitating th the thought process and uh, and uh, general demeanor of their culture without really process thinking about it much like say when you make a game about colonialism when you come from a colonial a colonialist country and you don't even really recognize that as being what you make and made a game about for example or if it's specifically making that incentive structure that's kind of cruel or whatever because it's specifically trying to satirize or criticize that exact concept which is the kind of thought process this game tends to generally be going at in fact, in this case, because it's a fake game within a game, it's extra the case that they invented this fake game to ex exactly criticize this kind of idea. Like, what? You're going to make life better for the people that live in your country? You'll never stand a chance. <laughs> Gaze on your workers like a benevolent parent. Hmm. Too bad investing in your workers isn't worth many points. What do you mean? Take a look at the scoring tables in the back. The lieutenant turns to one of those appendices you skipped over earlier. You see in table 8C that investing in territorial infrastructure multiplies your victory points total by one times. Which is to say, not at all. Whereas directing monuments in Revachal gives you a multiplier of five times. So you get victory points for fucking flexing on people, but not for making your own people have, ha have better lives. Erecting monuments. So you're saying the values of the ruling class are completely divorced from the well-being of the people who generate their wealth? Yes, precisely. 
Nonsense. Remember what the lieutenant said? If points are arbitrary, who cares about winning? You should reject their system and just play how you want. Ba bam. Except that's not how video. That's not how games work. Don't do this. Just, just so, we're, just so we're saying. Just in general, if you're playing a multiplayer game, you should always play to win. It's a funny joke and all that, or even like a fun like thought experiment to think about the idea that there might be ways to play a game that better illustrate what you consider to be a happy ending than what the mechanics set incentivize you to do. But you should always play to win if you play a tabletop game. Not not like aggressively or like antisocially and cruelly and like make everyone uncomfortable because you're like way too into winning or losing and all that. I just mean like you should always be taking actions that approach the end result of you winning every turn. Even if, like, it's, it's one thing to do it on accident, like to fuck up and not do good at, good at the game, but to throw the game is bad. Because many games, especially multiplayer ones, especially ones that feature more than two players, uh, the entire mechanic set assumes everyone's trying to win, and so the game actually can really quickly fall apart if one person is playing like a jackass just because they aren't into it, and they're like, doing random actions or they're intentionally throwing the game uh it varies from game to game how this can happen but for example if you're playing like a social deduction game like bang or resistance or other stuff like that like if one person just doesn't give a fuck and actively plays the game wrong then the entire conceit collapses instantly and then games like twilight imperium everybody has a certain amount of territory and resources and so on and so if one person just throws the game then their neighbors can become either massively advantaged or disadvantaged because they have one player that's basically not playing correctly so it's like either they can conquer all that guy's territory and then have a giant wrecking ball of a base or maybe they can just assume that that person will never attack them because they're basically not even playing so they can then focus all their attention on their other neighbor which then makes that person have to be specifically disadvantaged because they're being heavily focused by their neighbor because their neighbor has the unusual and unfair distinction of having an, a safe border on their other side and you know stuff like that uh it, you can critique the concept of how the game works but at the end of the day it's just an artificial little game and if you're playing wrong on purpose then you're just actively sabotaging the experience for everyone else the obvious exception being tabletop games, as in like tabletop RPGs, because the whole point is to roleplay and do whatever. So you could actively fuck yourself over all you want and do uh, and go weird, go on weird trips and do bizarre actions, because they can all be in character for your character. And that's part of the fun of that is that the freedom. That's where you get to go in the sandbox. Tabletop RPGs, that's the sandbox. Every other tabletop game, you're either playing to win or you're or you're actually being the guy that is maybe not going to get invited back next time that that group is organizing their uh, next uh, tabletop night on Discord. <laughs> this is getting very autobiographical. Because <laughs> I, I know of multiple exiled people over the years where it's like, oh god, yeah, that person just fucking just basically flips the table. Not literally, but they functionally do by behaving this way. But here we're in a video game, so it doesn't really matter if I'm playing the game wrong to prove a point because the entire game exists exclusively within this video game as a thought experiment to begin with so i can exper experience and explore this thought experiment however i desire anyway <laughs> this rant on tabletop etiquette <clears throat> don't be that guy because you don't you'll, you'll find yourself not being able to play more tabletop games in the future now it's the lieutenant's turn to respond he moves aggressively onto the Safre territory, soon as workers are producing a steady supply of extremely valuable apricots. For several turns, you struggle to respond to Lieutenant's burgeoning apricot empire. Burgeoning! <laughs> Eventually, you relocate the majority of your workers to Sopramundi and Saramiriza, where they begin to uh, begin producing a bumper crop of cocaine tokens. You draw a new contract card. According to the text, there's an aristocrat willing to trade a large supply of cocaine for a number of coins and access to a rare bonus. Amplified music worth seven victory points. You know, this isn't unlike the situation the historical Ravisholian Sudranti faced in Safra in the middle of the last century. Tell me more. Well, the Caesarean... The Caesarean was... Uh, looking for new markets for all the cocaine it was producing, and it settled on Safra. 
By introducing cocaine into Sathra under exclusive contract, the suzerain created an extremely valuable captive market for an extremely addictive product. That's... fucked up. If you could somehow get lieutenants workers addicted to your cocaine, you could not only make them less productive, but you could force lieutenants to pay you for the, your cocaine tokens each turn. Can you even do that? Yes, you can. It's right there in the rules. Motherfucker. You've reached a critical strategic juncture. How do you respond to the tenant's aggression? Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, Kim, you're not gonna like this. Introduce the tenant's workers to cocaine. Jesus Christ. Attack the lieutenant and steal all of his resources. I think I would lose if I tried that. I can also just say fuck it and quit playing, funnily enough. I see, what was the move I had before you brought that up? Amplified music. Let's trade my cocaine for music instead of getting- instead of doing that nasty shit I was about to do. Rock and roll, baby. It takes several turns, but you slowly begin accumulating the cocaine necessary to complete the contract. When you do, it practically rains cardboard coins on your side. Stack the coins in neat little piles to annoy the lieutenant. Despite your conspicuous display of wealth, the lieutenant still has a formidable store of coins and resources. The end game is upon you. How will you spend the vast resources you've acquired for the glory of the suzerain? Flipping through the manual, you find the most expensive structure in the game, the Revacholian Victory Column, worth 12 victory points. If you can successfully build it, victory would be all but assured. Alternatively, you could try launching a trade war to crush the lieutenant's economy. Or you could blow all that money on a public education system for your worker tokens. Choice is yours. Build a public education system for your workers. There's a reason very few players ever attempt to build a public education system for their workers. It's extremely expensive and never pays off. By design. They added those words just to highlight the fact that they're making a point. Your boondoggle nearly bankrupts the suzerain treasury, and you suffer a significant penalty to your final score. Ouch, Lieutenant says, cringing at your spectacular failure. You taught me that points are arbitrary. I decided to play the game how I wanted instead. Lieutenant opens his mouth as if to issue a blistering retort, then hesitates. You know, Detective, there's something admirable about that in its own way. Now, tally up the scores, shall we? Computing the final scores is almost a game unto itself. What is this, Carcassonne? <laughs> You each spend an inordinate amount of time making stacks of coins, consulting tables, and struggling with basic addition and multiplication. After double and triple checking your maths, you have your final score. Negative five victory points. You'll be lucky if the suzerain doesn't have your whole family executed for such a pitiful performance. Lieutenant looks up from his tabulations. I've got 20 points, he says, slightly embarrassed at the point differential. Well, there's always next time. Figuratively, I mean, there's no way we have time to play this game again. Now let's clean up and get back to work. He crushed me as expected, and now I'm having a thought. What is the thought? The wasteland of reality. The one that's been plaguing the last day for me. Oh god. <clears throat> Congrats. You're sober. It'll take a while for your body to remember how to metabolize anything that isn't sugar from alcohol, so you're going to be pretty ravenous soon. Eat plenty. You can expect your coordination and balance to improve in a couple of weeks. In two months, you might start sleeping like a normal person. Full recovery will take years, though. It's depressing. And it'll be boring. Don't expect any further rewards or hand claps. This is how normal people are all the time. Fuck. Wow. <laughs> what a cynical fucking thing. Minus one Inland Empire for being sober, minus one Physical Instrument for Insomnia, minus one Suggestion for being boring, plus one Psyche, Return to the Self. No positive effects from alcohol. Holy fuck, this game is like aggressively punishing me for trying to be sober. <laughs> I 
There's so many negatives. Negative, 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 positive, negative, 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 positive, positive, negative. <laughs> the thought cabinet has largely been a negative influence on my character. Uh, sometimes negative points are a good thing, though. Not a good thing, but like they lead to they can lead to interesting story outcomes. Is what I mean to say. They're not like good on like a fucking ugh. poor stats so low. Oh, it's the one that makes me sober. I gotta keep my sobriety though. That's what I'm role playing, so I gotta keep this stu stupid skill. I was gonna just I was gonna delete the Wompty Dompty Dom Center once I appre once I went after uh I forgot her name. Ruby. I almost said Alice. I'm like, that's not right. I was gonna delete this when I went after Ruby. Uh that was the plan at, at first at least. It's like I wanna keep this thought in mind as I go through the Wompty Dompty Dom Center, but when I'm done with it, maybe I can delete it. But instead it's just gives me ten experience all the time. But it reduces my suggestion. A lot of these reduce the stats that I can't make better. So that's pretty rough. Not having a great time here. <clears throat> At least my shivers is high. Uh, precarious world makes my crit fails and successes slightly more common, basically. That might be the one to switch out so I can try something else. Like Arno Van Eyck. the door I do like the idea of processing the fact that I can't open one more door I can't get rid of being a, a socialist or being sober these are too important to my character on a role-playing level and the art degree in Wompty Dom, Dom Center too important on a progression level. But then a lot of these other ones increase my caps, which lets me actually still be able to open up checks and stuff like that. This is actually kind of rough. I'm getting really set in my way, where some of this stuff's just going to be inac inaccessible as options. So the precarious world's probably the most throwawayable one. It just slightly broadens my crit fails and successes. Goodbye. One more door. It's also fun reading this and voice acting myself reading that, so I kind of want to have it pan out. Alright. Hope you had fun, Kim. Who am I kidding? I know you had fun. Haha. 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 Still. Well, that didn't take as much time as I thought it would. Still have like four hours to go. Is Kuno still around? Maybe he is. Wall. 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 More lessons in basic reality? She's positively surprised. My favorite part of the day. Go ahead, ask me anything. What is this? Spread your hands. A bird? She tilts her head. A... Sphenicid. A flightless bird of the polar regions. Keep guessing. Some sort of... Krill hunter. No, wait. Joyce raises her eyebrows. You're an ancient ruin. A symbol of hubris and decay. Half submerged in some salty sea. What, really? Of course you're not, my dear. I'm just terrible at guessing games. I'm kind of just seeing what else I can unpack, unpack about this place. Tell me about this world again. What do you see? Great bodies of water. Forest-covered surfaces. Clusters of light where the cities lie. 
You've seen the montage. We all have. This world is enough, she concludes. A frisson lifts the hair up the back of your arm. The wind sweeps the surface of the bay. The wind is sweeping the waters. The world is a suzerainty of Ravashal. There's a term of endearment they coined for it, the DeLorean century, when human was high on this world, when humanity was high on this world, discovering more and more of it. These archipelagos included. What is it? Elysium. Bum bum. Yeah, we've been through here before, though. Right, this is when I found out about, like, the strange shape that the world in was in, which is its own bizarreness. Where are we? We're at Martinez, baby. Tell me about another, perhaps even more fundamental aspect of reality. No, I just loops back. No. I don't think I have a lot to touch. Yeah. No, this doesn't look good. I was hoping I had more to talk to her about. But it seems to not be the case. False alarm from the comments. Let's do some book reading then. I really need to be 22 o'clock. <laughs> the greatest innocence. Have I read this one already? Yes. Book Dick Mullen and the Mistaken Identity. Another Dick Mullen book woefully misrepresenting the police work. In this one, our detective returns from a trip having successfully solved 100 year old cold case, only to embark on another. Does he finally face the taxing nature of his occupation? No, he doesn't even look like a normal law officer. In your hand, you hold Dick Mullen and the Mistaken Identity. A brittle paperback feels fragile to the touch. Examine the, t the cover. The cover features a pastiche of different scenes. In the foreground, a man in dark overcoat clutches a pistol to his chest. Rising up behind him are two silhouettes wrapped in a passionate embrace. The tagline reads, Detective Dick Mullen must prove his innocence after an old friend is murdered by someone who looks just like Dick Mullen. <gasps> that seems to sum up the premise nicely. Are you really reading that, Detective? I really need to, I really need to know who this Dick Mullen guy is. Good luck finding it. He's not much of a character. I think you'll find. Just a stand-in for the reader. The point is for the reader to feel like they're solving the crime along with Dick Mullen. A crude narrative convention, but no less effective for it. Start reading. The story opens with a knock at the door. Detective Dick Mullen is greeted by an old friend, Charlie Spillane, who has come to Mullen to ask a favor on this dark, cold night. Spillane needs Mullen to drive him from Vesper to a small town along the Inselindian coast. Despite his friend's apparent agitation, Mullen does as he's asked, then returns home where he passes out drunk, as he does most nights. I mean, I can kind of judge. Nah, I don't need to read this. I'm already living it. Oh, no. That is a reaction people have to media sometimes. It's like it's too much reminding them of what they already don't like about their lives. Keep reading. Two days later, Mullen is arrested by the Vesper police and charged with the murder of Charlie Spillane. At his interrogation, Mullen learns that Charlie Spillane was shot in a bar in the very town Mullen dropped him off in by a man matching Mullen's description. Desperate to clear his name, Mullen manages to convince the Vesper police to release him for three days so that Mullen may solve his friend's murder and prove his innocence. The cops release their prime murder suspect so that they can find the real killer? Are you shitting me? What's the matter, detective? Lieutenant turns to you with a start. I don't know who's writing this shit, but I get the feeling they aren't ex experts on homicide investigations. Lieutenant shrugs, resigned to the idea that his profession will rarely, if ever, be accurately represented in art and literature. 
Okay, so Mullen didn't do it. Of course Mullen didn't do it. That's the whole premise of this book. Anyway, Mullen returns to the seaside. What just came up? Oh, it's me highlighting my equipped items. Right, you can do that there, I guess. It's like, what was that pop-up? Anyway, Mullen returns to the seaside bar where Spillane was murdered and meets a beautiful, mysterious woman named Diana de Nouve. Now it's getting interesting. Ooh, breakthrough. De Nouve reveals that she was Spillane's lover and that he was mixed up in a local amphetamine smuggling uh, operation. As soon as Mullen begins pulling at strings, the whole conspiracy begins to unravel. Not only is the local police captain in the amphetamine ring, so is the son of a powerful politician and a strung out art collector named Torvald, each of whom has his own reasons for wanting Spillane dead. Tell me about the police captain. This isn't how books work, by the way. You read them in order. <laughs> you know, just like branching dialogue your way into like, which one would you like to learn about next in this book that where the pages are in a sequence? Outwardly, the old police captain's a real law and order crypto fascist. A barrel chested man who's beaten his share of suspects to a pulp. But he's also dirty and increasingly paranoid that someone's going to expose his role in the drug ring. He would certainly have the motive and the means. But the captain walks with a noticeable limp from an old war injury. Is it possible he was able to conceal it long enough? To commit the murder? Stop. <laughs> Stop, body. You're betraying me. I want to hear the politician's son. A typical privileged twat. In all likelihood, he's just in over his head. He does bear a personal grudge against Spillane, though. A former prosecutor who nearly brought down his father's administration. The kid doesn't exactly have Dick Mullen's manly build, but he is the correct height, and while interrogating him at his home, Mullen did notice a certain overcoat that looked suspiciously like his own. What was that about the art collector? Torvald the art collector is a strung out mess. Frankly, it's hard to imagine him holding a pistol steady enough to actually hit someone, let alone plug them three times in the chest the way old Splane got did. <laughs> got did. That said, Torvald and Splane have a long history, and while interrogating him, Mullen discovered that Torvald was once involved with Diana Denuva. Could it be that this is all over a sordid love triangle? <gasps> Let's go on with the story. One evening, Deanna Deneuve comes to Mullen's house uh, room in tears. The two of them drink a half a bottle of vodka, and soon they're seeking comfort in each other's arms. <laughs> nice, get it, Mullen. <laughs> and the two, this is actually actually a little fucked up because they're, yeah, drinking and crying. As the two lovers share a post-coital cigarette, Deanna Deneuve, uh, Deneuve, Deneuve. I don't know. Do 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 Dan e u v. Oopsie. Ah fuck fuck fuck! I'm clicking on all the wrong parts of the screen. No. This is this is Catherine, the new but whatever. Pronounce names dot com. Shut up. Catherine Deneuve. Deneuve. I don't know. Do I have to pronounce it like that? That way that people will be like, I am speaking in my normal accent, and then suddenly Deneuve. As the two lovers share a post-coital cigarette, Deanna Deneuve turns to Mullen and says, By the way, Dick, there's something else I meant to tell you. Always aim for the center mass. Whatever it is, Mullen never hears the words. A blow to the base of his skull knocks him out cold, instantly. Fuck. Oh, the lights just turned on. Transition to, to 22, or 20 o'clock. Uh, when Mullen comes to, Danu is dead on the hostile, hostile bed next to him. To make matters worse, his clothes are covered with her blood. Double fuck. 
Mullen trashes his blood-stained clothes and flees the hostel, knowing it's only a matter of hours before the cops discover Denis's body, if they haven't been tipped off already. The heat is on. If Dick Mullen can't solve both murders before the cops catch up to him, he's going away for life. Can you solve the case before the cops close in? Wait, I've got some questions first. What is it, detective? Why am I allowed to ask questions? It's a book. <laughs> Why does everyone close to Dick Mullen want him de wind up dead? It's a dangerous line of work. But somebody has to do it. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this, this is hacky writing. That's why Dick Mullen never lets anyone get too close. Why did Dick Mullen become a detective in the first place? There was never a time when he wasn't a detective. He was born a detective. Why was I not born a detect to be a detective? For a moment, you cease to read the story on the page and see the book for what it is. A collection of brittle, cheaply printed pages held together by glue made from the hooves of horses. You won't find the answers you're looking for here, in other words. Why bother solving crimes when the world's so evil? Is it so e is it really so evil, detective? Okay, maybe not. There's some parts worth saving. Like disco. Like what? The pleasure of contemplating art. You don't know how you know, but you can feel the book laughing at you. Yeah, well fuck you, your book's hack. Art? You think contemplating art is going to save you? Yes, I'm the goddamn art book, a art cop after all. Whatever you say, art cop. The book has stopped laughing, but you can feel it grinning smugly at you. Hey, fuck you, book. Flip off the book. You, know, you look like a madman, right? Giving an inanimate object a finger like that? What's the matter, detective? This book is making fun of my sincerest beliefs. And perhaps you should stop reading it. No! <laughs> but you can't stop, can you? You've got to find out what happens. I figured it all out. So who did it, detective? Who killed Charlie Splane and Deanna de... de Love dead them in. What? It doesn't even make sense. There's never a straight answer from you, is there? You just get hooked on random stupid notions and then repeat them every chance you get. Now go on, find out who really did it. You begin furiously flipping through the pages. Even as you know that these books follow a series of well-worn tropes, you find yourself completely engrossed. You turn in pages so fast you don't even notice the ancient spine coming unglued. You try to grab the pages as they come loose, but your fingers aren't quick enough. They're gone. Dozens of pages scatter across the ground. <coughs> ah, it's cr scratchy. The last fifth or so of the book seems to have been lost. How the fuck did you do that? <laughs> did they just did they disappear into two millimeter like hole in the world? It's possible you could gather and reassemble the pages, but it would take way too long. Stupid old horse glue. Ah uh, yes, the problem with mass make, mass market paperbacks. They're not made to last. Right, the difference between normal paperbacks and mass market is that they're like... Garbage, basically. I like hardcovers. Partly just because I just like the pages to be really big. <laughs> you guys have already seen that I try to increase the font size of every uh, game I play where I'm going to be reading a lot. I just find it preferable. One of the upsides of Kindles, the downside of Kindles, is using Kindles. And also you don't get to have a nice bookshelf covered in colorful things in your room that's of all the, bo of all the things you like. Kind of nice to have a visual, like, it's nicer to have the entire Junji Ito collection on a shelf together than it is to have them in a digital folder somewhere where you'd be like, oh yeah, let me, let me just go find them. Uh, I like, I like, I do like holding a book, but I do like the fact that magic books let you change their, their font sizes. The nuts made the last. I mean, you know me, I go on tangents and shit, so if I go on a thought tangent, it's really helpful to be able to find my place again when there's not as much text on the screen as compared to like some of these books I've seen that just have like a monstrous number of words per pages. And yet I'm the same jackass that will go and buy like a book that's like, here's one book that has the complete works of all of Lovecraft or the complete works of all of Sherlock ever made. And it's like, great. <laughs> Those are going to be miserable to read because there's they're, so much book being packed into a, uh, as little space as possible. Why, did I, why do I do this to myself? But then if you buy too many individual books, you're like, what am I going to do with all this stuff when I move again? Because, like, I've never... 
lived in a situation that I could ever de de determine to be permanent for myself. So it means I always have to be in anticipation of the next time I move. And it's like, the more books I buy, the harder moving gets. Unless I just want to get rid of the books. But that's sad, too. <laughs> Perhaps this is a sign that you should get back to solving your own murder. Oh, blah. Your own murder, eh, detective? My own murder? <gasps> when does that happen? <laughs> In your hand, you hold four-fifths of Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. Put the book away. I can't believe that just fucking... Really? Holy shit, that's a really thick book for a mass market paperback. That wouldn't last at all. Oh, look at those eyes. Strangely, yeah, they kind of, they kind of remind me of uh, Night in the Woods. Hyamdala man, the man from Hyamdal. I read, yeah, I read that one already. The, this, I, I was trying to remember if I read the description already. A classic. On the front... On the frontispiece, an, an anatomically unrealistic muscle man is uh, reaching into a mountain stream, yearning to touch its glimmering... his glimmering mirror image. His eyes are full of childlike wonder. On the blood-soaked snow right next to him lie two giant Sveihandas. I'm gonna blow your guys' mind. Sfihanda means two-hander. Wow. That was hard to translate. <laughs> it's, little, it's just it's just the German word for two-handed sword. Nobody doesn't know this. <laughs> Everybody knows this already. <laughs> the cover of this tattered paperback features the man of Hjelmdal. Hjelmdal. Uh, standing on top a pile of bloody corpses. What? That's not what you just said. His two Zweihunders are covered, are crossed over his massive chest and dramatic X, their blades dripping with gore. I... You just told me that the cover was the other thing, where he's reaching for his own reflection in the stream and his Zweihunders are on the ground in bloody snow. How do you... Did I mess something up? Seems... Over the top? Beneath him rise the harsh, snow-capped peaks of his native Northlands. In bold red letters, the title Hyamdalaman, the man from Hyamdal, unfurls like a banner. On the foreground, a nearly nude woman lies spread in supplication, her private strategically covered by her flowing black hair. Naked women and giant swords. Is that really the best they could come up with? Feels formulaic and derivative. Look at the back cover. The black blurb reads, His latest adventure serves the perfect introduction to the savage Hjelmdal saga. Meet, uh, meet man from Hjelmdal, his, fa uh, his faithful blood brother Tyrbald, his the noble lord Vrothgar, and some of their most fearsome foes yet. For the Northlands, for Hjelmdal. Below, in smaller font, you see the parenthetical. Adapted from Man from Hjelmdal and the Necromancer's Treasure, Man from Hjelmdal, Lord of Hrothgar, and Man from Hjelmdal, the Curse of Nakther. What? Wait, there's Man of Hjelmdal books that are adaptations of other Man from Hjelmdal books? A brazen attempt to bilk fans for more money by splicing together old stories into a new title. Wow. Fuck you. The publishers must have a dim view of their readership. Their main concern is the continuation of the franchise, not making literary, literary history. Let's read the first couple pages. The story opens in media res. The man from Hjelmdal and his band of northern reavers are in the bowels of an ancient temple, surrounded by an army of gibbering whites led by the deathless necromancer. One by one, the braven Northmen fall to the relentless crush of undead, only to join their number as reanimated corpses. By nightfall, only the man from Hjemdal and his blood brother, Noble Tyrbald, are left standing against the dead horde. It is an honor to die by your side, brother, Tyrbald cries as his battle axe beheads one of the reanimated comrades. Wow, they're in trouble now. Hiden, Tyrbald, the man from Hjelmdal bellows over the army of flesh and bone. Have courage for the Northlands, for Hjelmdal. He leaps to the mezzanine to 
face the black-eyed figure, and like a mad ice bear whirling twins, Vihandas, Sturm and Drang, and Drang, he plows through the ranks of the deathless surrounding the necromancer. The rider has never held a sword in their life, let alone two two-handed swords at the same time. It is phys physically impossible for a human being to effectively dual wield Zweihander swords in any kind of real life combat situation. Never heard of monkey grip talents? Uh uh. And with deathly finesse, his twin blades scissor the necromancer's head from his body, like Count Dooku. <laughs> the undead legions collapse like ragdolls as the dark magic leaves them, and the two Northmen stand alone in the accursed temple where the bodies of the lost brothers litter the floors. Skip ahead. A few chapters uh, a few chapters later, the man from Hyamdal and Tirbald are in a completely different setting, high above an arid desert, riding a pair of griffins that always appear, seem to appear narratively convenient moments. Ha <laughs> ha. This book makes a mockery of the very idea of good plotting. Though something tells you coherence was never the point. The Northmen find themselves in the court of a powerful north, uh, southern king, Lord Hrothgar. The old king beseeches the man from Hjelmdal to ride his king, uh, rid his kingdom of the Nachtener, a subterranean clan of blind wizards who traded their souls for demonic powers. The man from Hjelmdal extracts a high price from the desperate king. He asks land for the homeless desert pygmies living exiled in the kingdom's borderlands. Rothgar offers the hand of his eldest daughter instead, but the son of Winter does not budge. Hold on, why is the man of Hyamdal doing any of this? What do you mean? Why is, why is he doing all this? Because the flames of justice burns bright within his chest, because, all of, uh, because above all he is driven to bring honor to the name of his beloved Hyamdal, because his noble Catelyn blood Lusts for glory and conquest. It cannot be denied. Is that all? What do you mean, is that all? Is there, like, anything else to his character? He is the man from Helmdal, forged in the fury of battle. Death was his sire and blood his dam. He has but fourteen winters when he let... He, he had but 14 winters when he left his frigid homelands to Katla to seek glory and honor. That is his character. He doesn't even have a real name. What is inside this man? Or is muscle and bone all he is? Okay, but does he have like any in internal tension? He is the wildest man alive, the only mortal strong enough to wield the twin Zweihanders, Sturm and Drang, whose names mean Storm and... Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I get that. He's strong, he has big swords. Why should I care about this character? What are you, a book critic? Actually, yes, I'm a goddamn art cop. <laughs> Enough! You're ruining the pacing of the story. Now where did you leave off? Ah, oh, yes. What pacing? You skip past a section detailing an elaborate banquet with many toasts, as well as a long and perilous journey from Rothgar's Keep to the ancient forest of Yezdor, where his heroes infiltrate the Nacht in his dire hall. In the center of the Great Hall stands a blood altar on which a pair of Nachtener are disemboweling a shrieking peasant, an unholy rite that empowers the Nachtener forbidden magic. As the vile ceremony ends, the sound of steel unsheathing draws the Nachtener's uh, attention to a, a pair of cloaked figures standing in the doorway. Swiftly, the visitors toss off their cloaks and unsheath glimmering northern steel. It's the man from Helmdal and his valiant blood brother, Tearbald. Well, yeah. Who else would it be? In an instant of Nacht, in an instant the Nacht uh, summon a horde of gibbering orcanoids who rush the heroes. The halls fill with the clang of blades and the screams of dying as the floor goes slick with steaming orcanoid viscera. Oh, for fuck's sake. When the din of battle settles, only the man from Helmdal and Tirbald remain standing, exhausted and dripping with the entrails of their foes. The two northern northmen confront the foul Nachtener. The man from Helmdal's sodalite blue eyes fill with indescribable fury. 
For the Northlands, he cries, rushing headlong into a desperate melee. You gotta be kidding me. What? This is exactly the same as the first scene. Even the word gibbering is used twice. In the first scene, the man from Helndal fought a powerful necromancer and his army of the dead. Now he's confronting a, a pair of Nakthero and their horde of Orkanoid thralls. The two couldn't be further apart. Okay, fine. What happens next? An excellent question. One easily answered by purchasing the next thrilling chapter in the Hyamdalerman saga, Hyamdalerman at the Gates of Tomorrow. The last page of this one merely reads, To be continued. Considering the sheer amount of different Hyam Dollarman books out there, it's very unlikely you've ever, you're you're ever going to find the sequel. The man from Hyamdal stares at you from the cover, his face fixed in grim resolve. Fuck off. <laughs> but hey, experience points, because that's how this game works. <laughs> this bizarre, strange game works like that. Hooray! Da 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 da. I can't go back to my thought. Oh wait, did I finish the thought? I did. There is no way to open the supply depot door. Accept it. You cannot open all the doors. You have to integrate this into your character. Some doors will forever remain closed. Even if every single other door will open at one time or another. Maybe to a key. Or maybe to some sort of tool meant for opening doors. But this one will never accede to such commands. A realization crucial to personal growth. Crucial. Ooh. Interesting. Minus one half light for as long as I keep it around, but I get all Psy White checks are unlocked? All Psy checks. That'll give me something to do for a minute, huh? This size purple. Yeah. Oops. That involves Kuno. I just unlocked Kuno. <gasps> oh, Kuno. I would like to- Kuno likes this brain shit, thinking shit. I would like to unpack you now. Oh, there's Kuno here! <gasps> Look at my chance. Look at my chance. Figure out what's going on with this kid. <sighs> it's been all game and we've finally done it. It's not Kuno. It's Kuno S. Interesting, how? Kuno S is by far the worst of the two. Kuno has no problem being near you, but the other hides behind the fence, afraid for her life, like she's done something. Something very bad. She came up with that psychopathic scheme of screaming for help before. Kuno just wanted to talk to you about his name. Kuno S was the one who wound him up and directed him. Also, Kuno hasn't stopped talking to you. Even enjoys it from time to time. When you talk to the other one, it's like talking to a cornered animal. She only hisses. All in all, Kuno respects madness. You cannot hope to out outdo her on that front. You must win yourself a few minutes with him alone. Act on it. Try to separate them. Kuno, st Fuck you whispering about! He whispers back. He's whispering too. He's going with it. Fuck you whispering about! <laughs> but watch what happens. Whispering about. She puts extra stress on that word, expecting it will make you uncomfortable. If Kuno wants to whisp, <laughs> if Kuno wants to whisper, he's going to fucking whisper. Okay. He turns back to you and hunkers down. Let's whisper, pig. This is it. You've got him. But be careful. You can still fuck this up. Don't make Kuno look bad in this. But don't say that he's that she's being that she's controlling him because then, uh, it'll like make him look bad. So what's up with her? She's terrifying, crazy, scary, crazy. He whispers tensely. You don't know the half of it. 
She's not crazy, she's insane. Dangerous. She smoked a man. She's done people in. Probably even pigs. Stop talking to him! Cool, no, I'm fucking warning you, you're gonna get into us into shit! She understands what you're trying to do. Yo, see? He pops his head up. Did Kuno not tell you? Kuno told you? Kuno talks to whoever he wants? He hunches down again. Talk, pig. Kuno's got it under control. You did it. They're separated. He's even turning his back to her, so she can't read his lips. Fuck, she can read lips? You should cup your mouth. Am I cupping my mouth? What do you mean she smoked someone? Kuno means she killed someone. That's right, she's a killer. He stares at you intently, like actually a killer. His little green eyes are fixed on yours. He meant everything he said before, but right now he not only means it, he is sincere. You serious about this killing business? Killing is serious shit. Kuno is always serious about it in the 488. 488? Criminal code doesn't go higher than 190. She's probably killed a pig too. I mean, I'm pretty sure she has. Okay, how many cops has she killed then? Forget Kuno said that. Kuno was just shitting. Kuno was just running his mouth. Kuno's stupid like that. He feels eyes in the back of his head and stops. There's something cold in the air. Like water, lapping against cold stones, or dripping. In a hallway nearby, three years ago, there were shoes in the corner. Three years ago there were shoes in the corner? Wait, they used to have a third friend? Did she kill him? Is that what you're saying? You think she has anything to do with the dead man? Kuno wasn't around, and she was with Kuno. Told you this already. Where were you? Look, Kuno's gonna put you at ease. We didn't do it. He speaks the truth, my liege. Well, it's convenient to have a magic skill that just tells you when people are telling the truth. Unless it's lying. Fuck. What's the what's with the language she uses? Napa Kimpi. Fageri. Fuck knows. She says it's the song of her people or some shit. What people? Crazy people, the fucking Nakis, I don't know. It's Sirus. The, the Suru are an indigenous ethnic minority in the social democratic powerhouse Vasa, on the tundra and taiga covered is <clears throat> isola of Katla. Far, far away from here. As far as possible, really. Are they red people there? Red haired people there? You mean evil little red haired people like her? Yes, they do. The Suruis have that ginger gene. Who know? Could she be Suru Sur Suruis? Suruis? Like that man from Hemdal shit. The kid lights up. She could be. She could be from the. She could be that Hemdal shit. The, fu the fact that we're referencing the book I just read is really funny. Out of all this game, Revishal does have a small Suruis company, a community. Or she climbed in a yakberry crate and was shipped over accidentally. Is she your sister? Fuck no, she's not my sister. She's just a stray who got in. Like a mad dog or some shit. Stray? Yeah, she was just there. He points to the apartment building behind the fence. What was that, Kuno? Little one twists her neck, looking at the building. Kuno flinches, then lowers her voice, his voice even more. She was in the hallway, dripping wet, by the fucking shoe rack in the dock. Why was she dripping wet? Kuno's got no fucking idea. Her hair was all wet. I think she pissed on the floor, too. She was there for three days in the corner, every time Kuno went out. He said she got in, how? I don't know. Someone left the door open. Kuno comes home and she's sleeping under the desk under a pile of clothes like a dog. Someone left the door open? It was him. By accident or... On purpose. What about your parents? Kuno's dad doesn't give a shit. 
doesn't even see her there. Or thinks it's fucking Kuno. He points at himself. Shit's all on Kuno. You said she's insane? Yeah, she's psycho. He leans in, leans in even closer. None of that kitty psycho cat burning shit. She has the real deal. What's the real deal? Snuff radio shit. Believe me, pig, you don't want to know. And he doesn't want to even think about it. This isn't just another boast. How are you dealing with all this? How's Kuno dealing? Kuno's dealing just fine. He doesn't need you fucking with any of it. She so doesn't either. Kuno's got this shit under control. He spits through the gap of his front teeth. Ugh. Ugh. You need backup? I'm here for you. Listen, listen. He points to his eyes, then yours. See is Kuno's go-to. Kuno's protecting her. You fuck with C, you fuck with Kuno. You threaten her, you threaten to take her away. This is what it all comes down to. He needs you to take him seriously now. The boy looks you in the eye. Black pupils trying to focus. I am going to kill you. I'll run when you put the cuffs on her. Sneak up on you later and fuck you up, you understand? Understood, Kuno. All right. He wipes the sweat off his brow. Now we can do business. Business? Yeah, what do you want? Kuno can hook you up with... He starts, no longer whispering. Don't take him up with shit, Kuno. See, relax. He, he respects Kuno. Kuno made him respect Kuno. You respect Kuno. He turns back to you. You get all kinds of shit. Kuno's gonna get you hooked on illegal narcotics. If you run a little errand for Kuno, get you hooked, pig. Get this hook in you. Get this hook. Get, <laughs> get his hook in you. Then Kuno's gonna get you hooking for more. Cash in big style, pig hooker. <laughs> See? It's tension and release with Kuno. Now we releasing. He pulls on his tracksuit trousers. The pant buying shit. Now that's on two. 90% discount for Kuno's pig. Kuno can flex. <laughs> Kuno. <laughs> Kuno flexes for hobos. Kuno sees your need. He spreads his hands like a baker presenting the goods. A smile spreads across his flushed face. Plus one savoir faire and physical instrument. Hey! That's a rare stat. Plus PI. That would have come in handy earlier. Damn it. I want to buy the fountain pants. Just to pay off this whole arc. Even though it takes all my money. Kuno unzips his jacket again and pulls the pants out of the plastic wrapping. Here, pig! We found now! Performance buddies! Kuno can already see you soaring through the air like a fucking eagle! He looks at you with pride. Pig's in Kuno's debt now! Money debt! No, I paid the money already, you lunatic. Money, de money debt doesn't mean anything. He's just saying words. You're not in his debt. What was that about you running in an errand and... About running you an errand in illegal narcotic narcotics, Kuno? Kuno gets it from his dad. Kuno and his dad are major suppliers. His eyes bulge. Their veins reach out like tree branches. That's where Kuno gets his lightning on. You're giving your tiny child drugs. Great. Problem is, Kuno and his dad had a little falling out. Now junkies clawing at Kuno's door. Streets going mad. Kuno's gonna gotta throw his dirty popo man at it. His dirty popo man. Oh no, that's me. Oh my god. <laughs> this, this mess. Let's unpack this next episode. <laughs>